Hi, my name is Susan and I'm a member of the Pennywell Lacemakers Group. This is a video about Limerick Lace made by the Pennywell Lace Makers. So in our video, firstly I'm going to show you some very old pieces of lace that we have in our collection, all belonging to members of our group. Secondly, Maureen is going to talk you through a little bit of history about Limerick Lace while we show you some of our pieces, our current pieces that we have made. After that, you will see a demonstration of the stitches, the basic stitches of Limerick Lace. And finally, you'll hear from some of our members talking about their experiences of Limerick Lace. Thanks for watching and we hope you enjoy. This is a piece by Eileen O'Donoghue. It's a tambour piece, very old design, and it's made by Eileen O'Donoghue. This piece is based on a design called Willis and it won a top award at the RDS in 1914. This is a collar belonging to one of our members, Eileen, and this is from the 1850s. It's a very old collar and Eileen actually bought this on the internet, but it's part of her collection. This is Eileen's own first communion veil. It belongs to Eileen, one of our Pennywell lace makers, who made her first Holy Communion in 1956. And this is Orla's communion veil, which belonged to her grandmother. And this was made in the 1930s, and it was made in the Good Shepherd Convent in Limerick. And here is a picture of Orla's grandmother wearing the veil on her first Holy Communion day. Now this is a picture of Miss Nora Dunn and Miss Nora Dunn was manageress of Limerick Lace School at 48 George's Street in Limerick. Florence, Florence Fear O'Brien commented in a letter that if Miss Dunn made it then it, it is assured to be of excellent work. Nora Dunn died in 1918. Now Maureen is going to tell us a little bit about the history of Limerick Lace. In 1829, Charles Walker set up the first ever lace factory at Mount Kennet House on the Dock Road in Limerick. He employed 400 women and children, producing a gossamer-like lace in silk, linen and cotton, using elegant designs from Brussels and working tambour style on machine net. The handmade lace was made on net stretched over large frames, one to mark a pattern, one to outline, one to fill, one to finish, etc. Irish made laces from Limerick was the envy of Europe. Large pieces like shawls, veils and trains were produced in best quality lace quickly and economically. Lace was at the height of popularity at this time and in great demand by royalty and celebrities of the day. Queen Victoria promoted and bought a variety of laces including Limerick lace. Mary Mills, a prize winning lace maker, introduced needle run lace to Limerick. Her granddaughter, Dolly, or Dorothy Stewart, is the woman behind the Stewart Trust Award of Fashion and Design at the Limerick School of Art and Design today. The tambour lace and the needle run lace, worked either separately or combined, produced in Limerick at this time, became known as Limerick lace, and soon Limerick lace was known and loved throughout the world. In mid-1840s, Walker had died, the famine had begun, lace makers had emigrated and the market had declined. In the 1840s, Lady De Vere of Dromoland and Corrie Chase in Limerick set up a lay school at her estate home to help relieve the poverty of local women during the time of the potato famine. She taught the art of applique of fine lawn or muslin on net to make coral lace, a small concern but great success. Forty years later, Florence Vere O'Brien used grandmother's lace designs to revive Limerick lace making in the city. Mrs Rice had a lace-making establishment on New Street. Maud Carney had Thomond Lace Industries. And in 1888, Mary Blake from the city worked the first Limerick Lace revival piece. And lace-making began again in the city. Florence Fear O'Brien backed the establishment of a lace school and engaged Miss Nora John as manageress and her sister Bridget John as teacher. Florence Fear O'Brien sourced excellent quality materials beautiful designs and the lay school benefited from her many contacts among celebrities of the day with orders and sales. The Limerick Lay School won top awards in Ireland, England and at Chicago's World's Fair of 1892 where a large consignment of lace was sold and the word of Limerick Lay spread across the world. 
In 1900, at Lady Anne Windsor's sale, Queen Victoria bought a black lace scarf made by Maggie O'Driscoll, and the Princess of Wales bought a white stole made by Bridget Doody, and again the popularity of Limerick lace grew. There were over 200 ladies working in lace making in Limerick City in the early 1900s. The Good Shepherd Sisters, the Mercy Sisters and Presentation Sisters were teaching lace up to the 1950s. Two of Nora Dunn's nieces, Eileen O'Donoghue and Bridget O'Donoghue, attended the Limerick Lace School and Eileen had an artistic flair and her talents were recognised and encouraged. Eileen trained in Limerick Lace Design and between 1908 and 1914 went on to receive numerous top awards to include her Art Teacher's Certificate at age 19. A sample book of lace designs along with patterns and lace pieces from the Limerick Lace School of this time have been donated to Limerick Lace Museum by Veronica Rowe, granddaughter of Florence Vera O'Brien. And a roll of Eileen O'Donoghue's designs have survived, dated 1910 to 1914, held in the Rowe collection donated to the Limerick City and County Museum in 2019. The lace school closed in 1923. Thomond lace industry operated up to 1950s. Canucks were making lace in the 1960s and the Good Shepherd made lace up to the 1980s. Little is heard of Limerick lace after the 1980s and lace making went into serious decline. An attempt to form a lace making business at the Tate Business Centre failed was found not to be economically viable. Eileen Brown of Rasbrine is making lace for the general market. But Limerick Lace has mostly receded to becoming a craft made by a few. Today, lace is taught at a few venues in town. Pennywell Lace Makers run by Eileen McCaffrey, Raheen Lace Group run by Anne Gabbett and Tony O'Malley's group. The traditional lace makers of Ireland based in Cork and the Guild of Irish Lace Makers based in Dublin, along with Ken Mayer Lace, hold classes throughout the year. My name is Eileen McCaffrey and I've been learning Limerick Lace for the past seven years. And these are the tools that you need to start making your lace. First of all, you need white and um, cotton bobbin net. Okay. And next, a pattern. Very important. Stainless steel pins and a hoop to put the net on. Needles and cotton thread, gentleman cotton thread. Oh, my scissors. Lace scissors. Lay scissors. Very important too. Yeah. To start making our lace, we place the net over the hoop, the bottom hoop, with the, the lines going horizontal. And then we place the top hoop over that, tighten the screw on top, Then the pattern is placed underneath and pinned. Now we're ready to tack the pattern in place and start our outlining with a double thread. Now this is the tacking of the pattern onto the net before we start to do our outline. And we just tack it a nice bit out from the actual pattern so that the threads don't get caught in the needle as we go around the outlining. Now we have the tacking done and the pins out and we're now starting to do our outline around our little motif. We're passing the needle through the loop at the end of the thread to start.
then we pick up a bar and then we skip a bar and we continue like that the whole way around as near to the pattern as possible. And now we have completed our little motif. It should look like this when it's done. And it's like a running stitch when it's finished. If we're doing a larger piece, we must outline all the work before we take the pattern off and, and start the stitches. I'm Susan and I'm going to demonstrate to you how to make light darn. So you need to make sure that your net is in the correct position. And when you're making it, you go under one cell diagonally, then you cross over the next cell and then you go under the next cell. So you're going in diagonally under the cell. Your thread crosses over the next cell. And then you go under again. So here's the final piece. This is the leaf done in light darn. And as you can see, you have a diagonal line of all the stitches that are going under the net. And then the stitches going over the net are also diagonally positioned. Hello, my name is Caroline and I'm going to demonstrate how you do heavy darn. The first thing is to attach the thread at the back of the pattern. You'll see this now on the video. I just make a small knot. And I catch the small end and just whip around one or two cells. Then I bring the thread out to the front of the work. Heavy darn is done in two parts. This is the first part, it's called laying the threads. You go twice around the outline. and you lay your thread along a diagonal row of cells. Again, you go twice around the outline, turn the work twice around the outline of the next row, and twice around the outline at the end of the row. You continue until the whole piece has all the threads laid down. You probably need to pull the thread reasonably tightly because if you don't, it makes the next section of the work very difficult to do. However, if it's too tight, you pull your outline shape out of shape. So now you can see what it's beginning to look like. And this is what it looks like when you have all the threads laid down. So then we can go on to the next part of the stitch. 
again attach your thread at the back I usually put a pin in the direction that I want the next section to the next lot of threads to go in it just helps me to guide to guide me for the first row these threads now will go at the opposite diagonal so that you end up with an X of thread in each cell. The first row can be rather difficult to do so I, as I say I usually put my pin in and you're going over the threads you've laid down and you're picking up the bar of the net. You have to do this for each over each thread. First row of this can be rather slow. As you can see, I've got a little knot. This is not uncommon, but you must take it out. Now, as in laying the threads, you go twice around the outline. You turn your work. Now, the next row should be easier and a bit quicker. Once the first row is set, I'm able to more or less weave in and out, and so it becomes a bit quicker to do. And you continue it like that until your out until your piece is finished. Yeah. My love of Limerick lace began when I was about seven years old, and my mom took me to see the lady who was making my Limerick lace veil for my communion. And I was absolutely amazed. I didn't I first met at a Limerick Lace class in what was then the Limerick Senior College in we think about the night early 1980s. We both learned for about a year, and for various reasons, neither of us was in a position to continue at that time. Um, and then after thinking about it for a long time. I made a New Year's resolution in 2013 that I was going to try and do something to revive Limerick Lace. By a happy coincidence, Eileen and I reconnected in 2013 and we discussed setting up a Limerick Lace class. Through a contact of mine in Cork, who's a Limerick Lace maker, we were able to make contact with the teacher, Marion O'Callaghan, and she agreed to teach our class if we could get a venue. And I found a marvellous venue and some willing students and we started up in September 2013 um, and we're still going strong. But this year in July we lost our beloved Marion O'Callaghan, our teacher. But we're going to try and keep going and do our classes in memory of her. Now we have Carmel O'Donnell. Carmel, there are over 40 Limitless stitches. What are your favourite ones? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> well, the, the stitches that always have to be included in Limerick Lace are the heavy darning and the light darning. Uh, the heavy darning is usually done on the outside edge to strengthen the edge. And then you have light darning, uh, which gives a variety to, to the uh, piece. 
but then the filling stitches or you you filling stitches all in any space that you can find you usually have filling stitches and i was i must say before i start on the filling stitches that the one the stitch i like a lot of people don't but i love heavy darning <laughs> which is a strange thing to say. If other lace makers were here now, they would say they would find that strange. But I find the heavy darning uh, very satisfying. You know, it's, it, it's, I suppose when I, as a child, we did darning and I was able, I was good at darning and I never found it any difficulty. But um, on the filling stitches, I like the caraway and the cobweb. Now the cobweb would be uh, used quite a lot uh, to fill in not not so big uh, spaces and uh, it, it's a, a very satisfying kind of a um, it gives a, a nice satisfying kind of a, a effect is what I'm saying uh, the, you know that's the that's the cobweb now the caraway would be it's um, I, I, I like it because it, it has a little bit of texture to it and I also like the uh, seed, which is a simple stitch that we we use. And you can have a seed and you can have the pull seed, where the same stitch is done and you pull the thread a little bit tighter and you have a different effect altogether. And there's your pull seed. Whereas the seed itself, but now I'll have to I'll have to turn this round now to see this. Uh, the seed itself is here. This is the seed itself. And this is the pull seed. So uh, I, there are the, most of them. I, I, I like doing most of them. I How do you choose where the stitches should go, Karen? You, uh, well, this uh, collar was started <clears throat> back in the 1980s <laughs> when I first started doing uh, Limerick Lace. And I went to one green on and I did a few classes. And uh, this colour would, would have been a, a traditional uh, pattern that they had and it includes uh, these spaces like horseshoe spaces they're called caskets right and they were for filling in you filled in the, the filling stitches in those caskets the outside of the casket is done in heavy darning because as you can see it's at the edge and then uh, you fill them in nowadays there's more um, the, the filling stitches are, is, are done in, in uh, any space that's enclosed, right? The caskets here are a little bit open at the top. But nowadays, uh, if you have an open space like that, you have big spaces and you have small spaces in between, and you fill in any of those, and they would be called caskets. That's where you would fill, put in the filling stitches. Jordana Gatchin. Why did you take up Limerick Lace? I took up uh, Limerick Lace because it became the subject of my postgraduate research. And uh, I work at the Limerick School of Art and Design. And that is the building where the Good Shepherd Convent was uh, um, sited. And uh, uh, Limerick Lace was made in that building until the 1980s. But there is virtually no sign of it. Absolutely not. And um, for me, it became very important to actually, as part of my research, to actually learn how to make Limerick Lace and I joined the Pennywell Lace group and um, and I became a, a very addicted to it. And and also I study a lot of the history and the social economical kind of uh, elements of it and I found that uh, it, it's very rich and it's very you know, dramatic and interesting and very, very uh, associated to Limerick. So um, uh, for me, it was a, became a, a way of uh, becoming even closer to Limerick, that is the city where I decided to make my home. And tell me, what do you think the future is for Limerick Lace? Well, Limerick Lace is very valid in the contemporary art, um, art and design conversation. Uh, many contemporary artists, they actually use uh, uh, handicraft such as Limerick Lace as a source of inspiration for their artwork. And um, personally, as an educator, I introduced it to my students and uh, they became very, very interested to the methods. 
naturally they wouldn't be they wouldn't know anything about it so i think it's very important for us uh, uh, for the future of limerick place to keep talking about it to keep bringing it up in the surface and bring it to to younger people younger generation that uh, they learn to appreciate the craft and uh, but at the same time, I understand that a younger person would bring in their own personal experience to the, these actual craft. So the my kind of I found my students uh, um, experimenting with materials, experimenting with size, experimenting with the images of the context they want to bring into their artwork, and the results were fantastic. So, I think that having a dedicated center for Limerick Lace and uh, a much stronger online presence. Would actually uh, that actually accommodates scholars, artists, designers, and just enthusiastic people uh, come in, learn about the method, the processes, but also of its history, mm -hmm. and now impact it onto um, the society in Limerick. Uh, that is extremely interesting. <laughs> Giordano, would you ever think of bringing it back to the Midwest coast of Italy, where you come from? Absolutely. Um, I would like to bring it definitely. And um, I would like to, you know, introduce the, you know, Irish lace to my uh, area because in Italy we're very proud of our own heritage of lace. As they say, the kind of uh, Punto Aria started in Italy. But at the same time, I think uh, the way it got used, in, in got developed in Ireland and uh, the type of uh, imagery, the type of the designs they apply to it is actually um, you know, it, it's very Irish, it's so different from uh, my culture and I think it really enrich everyone's experience and everyone loves Ireland anyway. <laughs> to Diana Cosgrave, why did you decide to take up Limerick Lace? I suppose as a child I was always get very busy doing embroidery and, you know, then graduated onto crochet, knitting, all of that. It was a household of crafts in the home. So that would be the reason. And where did you learn Limerick? Where did I learn Limerick Lace? Mm. Um, I learned Limerick Lace in Pennywell with Pennywell Lace Makers. I went to one of their uh, exhibitions and I was very, very keen because as a child, when I was about five years of age, I happened to be in Todd's with my mother and I saw this lady dressed in black doing tambour lace. And um, I didn't know the difference between needle run and tambour, so I just took it that every uh, Limerick Lace was done with a crochet hook. But I, uh, 50 something years later, or 60 years later, I learned the truth that there was two different laces. And do you collect lace? Do you? I do. I love anything antique. Uh, I like old furniture. I like old lace. I like um, Irish crochet being, again, the old type of crochet. I like anything like that. Susan Frawley. Why did you take up Limerick Lace, Susan? Well, I took up Limerick Lace because um, my mother was a great crafter at home and she was very much organised with making things and she did knitting and she did patchwork. So I would have seen it at home as a child, my mother sewing. And also my great, great grandmother, who I have a picture here, her name was Bridget O'Brien. and Bridget O'Brien was born in 1854 and she was a, a Limerick Lace maker. And my own grandmother, who's now in her 99th year, um, said to me that she would have made lace for Queen Victoria. And um, she also tells the story that her own mother would have asked my great-great-grandmother to make her wedding veil, but um, she would have said no because um, it would have taken too much time. And a lot of the lace that was sold back then was sold really to feed families because there were poor people making lace to keep their, their families with food, really. So that's the reason why I became um, a Limerick lace maker. And how do you see yourself passing on the craft of Limerick lace making? Okay, so I'm a member of Pennywell Lace Makers, and um, we really feel that the craft needs to be passed on, and we want it to be passed on, and we don't want it to die out. Um, so we are involved in lots of things in Limerick City to promote Limerick Lace um, in the city. Um, I'm a member of Friends of Lace, and we meet in Limerick Museum, and we conserve old lace that was donated by various people. Florence Bureau O'Brien's daughter would have donated um, Limerick Lace to Limerick Museum, and we would be involved in conserving that. Um, I was also involved in an exhibition we had in St Mary's Cathedral where we displayed lace for the, for the public. Um, I would have visited um, Charleville to see lace. Um, I've been to Kinsale and King Mayor, um, their lace festivals. 
Um, I'm also a member of the Irish traditional lace makers who meet in Cork once a month. So we will be down there making lace and of course promoting the Limerick lace with other crafters and other lace makers um, throughout Ireland.